Welcome to Birthright, a podcast about joy and healing in Black birth. Hi, I'm Kimberly Seals Allers, and welcome to Birthright, the podcast. I'm here today with Anna Malika Tubbs, a mother, a scholar. Anna is the author of The Three Mothers, How the Mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin Shaped a Nation. I, I love this idea of you kind of tapping into something else and tapping into ancestors because not only was, you know, you kind of entering this space of motherhood, but this was also a turning point for you in terms of your scholarly work. Tell us a little bit about what you've been up to and um, how motherhood is part of what you do. Yes, it's a huge part of my work. I just wrote the book uh, called The Three Mothers, How the Mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin Shaped a Nation about Alberta King, Bertus Baldwin, and Louise Little, and telling their life stories and helping readers understand how much life they were giving us long before they became literal moms through their art, through their creativity, through their activism, their passions, and their talents. They were such incredible women and really carried that forward through their motherhood experience um, and beyond. Unfortunately, all three of them lived um, to see their sons, these famous sons of theirs, um, to bury them, which is heartbreaking. But they also remind us of the continuance of these women's lives and what they were very passionate about and how they felt that it was now their time to educate their grandchildren and the next generation of their family. So the book is all about honoring their lives as well as honoring Black womanhood, Black motherhood as a whole and celebrating the diverse experiences that we bring to the table that we're all very different from each other. Part of this kind of reduction and dehumanization of Black women's identity is that so often people try to put us in this one box um, versus celebrating the rich nuance and diversity that we each bring to the table. And all three of them were very different from each other, although they had some of these similar um, shared experiences. And so studying them, um, I was researching them. I was in the middle of my research when I found out I was expecting Michael Malachi. I um, was had finished my first draft before he was born because I knew I was going to take my maternity leave very seriously. Um, and wanted to have that time with my newborn. And so I submitted, you know, 70,000 words to my editor, and as well as my advisor at the University of Cambridge, because it was also my dissertation topic, um, so that I could prepare for my labor. And then when he was already here born, and I was kind of editing chapters later after my maternity leave, he was kind of napping on my chest while I was writing and editing these stories about incredible women. So definitely in that day when I went into labor, I was thinking about the three of them, um, as well as so many others, and thinking even about the conditions that Black women throughout history have given birth in, Um, regardless of their own access to resources and privileges, what was going on around them? What were they fearful of? How did they tap into their strength? And it really just felt so empowering for me. You know, I was part of this long legacy of so many women who have done this countless times, Um, and felt really unified with them. You know, it's something that it's not to try to make it seem that like, if you haven't gone through this experience, you are, you know, missing out on something and not to say that in any way, but for those of us who have chosen this part of our lives, um, there's nothing like it. And I walk around and acknowledge all moms now in this way where we, we really see each other. Like we've gone through labor, you know, life has traveled through our bodies and that is incredible. And no one will ever be able to understand that unless you've gone through those really raw emotions, however it is that your labor went, you know, whether it was with an epidural or a C-section or vaginal delivery, whatever, the power of bringing life into this world is just incredible. And I was really tapping into that and just felt like, all these women were like, you've got this, you're just fine. And it really calmed me down. Yeah, that's so powerful. I think that, you know, when we think about all of our foremothers, certainly, you know, who who gave birth in fields and didn't even, weren't even allowed to be in hospitals and certainly weren't allowed to be supported. um, Mm. You know, you can definitely draw on a lot of strength because we're like, how did they do this? Right. Well, I think about women even who are in prison and gave birth while in chains or, you know, 
changed to a bed the inhumanity of that experience. It made me even more cognizant. Of course, we all recognize <clears throat> how awful that is. But when you're going through that experience, or even Michael and I have talked about that afterward for him to witness it, it's so awful to think of the conditions that women have been put through when they're just trying to bring their child into the world. Yeah. And it talks about whose who's, uh, bodies are valued, whose children are valued, and who, who, as you mentioned, have been demonized and dehumanized in this process. One of the things that I, well, I, I love your book. First, let me say that. Thank <laughs> um, you. It's such an amazing read, like the rich history, the storytelling. I just love reading all the depth that you went through to really capture these women wholly and completely. So thank you for putting this out there and giving us this um, amazing, rich body of work. Thank I was, you. I liked, and, you know, at one of the things at the beginning is the segment where you quote from some of us are brave. And there's a quote there that talks about black women exist and exist positively. And I thought about that particularly for birthright because, you know, what I am trying to do here is to really reframe a narrative of black birth, which has been mostly negative statistics, lots of uh, headlines that are focusing on black maternal deaths and a lot of doom and gloom. And I wanted to talk to you from your research about why is it so important for black women to exist positively? It's crucial for us to be seen in our wholeness, that it not necessarily be read as we only present positive facts about what's happening, but that it's complexity. It's not just as Melissa Harris Perry says, we're not just conquered victims as Black women. And there is a strange obsession in the United States with only seeing Black women in our pain, only putting us in the headlines when we've lost a child, when something has gone tragically wrong, um, and this human experience that everybody should feel, you know, very hurt by. But unfortunately, by casting a light only on our pain, it's also numbed people to our pain in a lot of ways. It's confirmed this narrative that Black women are somehow superhuman and can withhold and tolerate more pain than any other human being. And that that's not the reality. That's not true. Um, but when we're presented in our, in our wholeness, in our joys, in the way that we thrive, not only survive and cope with all the attacks against us, but also find life and find joy and find fulfillment um, while navigating the pain, navigating the challenges, that's when we're seen as the human beings who we are. And in my book, I try very hard to reach that balance of acknowledging the difficulties. We can't ignore those either. The Black maternal health crisis is real and people need to know about it. Mm -hmm. But we also cannot only be seen as constantly grieving, um, conquered victims who are just waiting on a system to save them. Instead, it's despite these attacks against us, despite this way in which we've been treated as less than human, despite even by law being the only ones deemed the givers of property, not the givers of life through our children in times of slavery, mm. we have claimed our humanity. We have said, we are worth every ounce of dignity and respect. Our children are worth every ounce of dignity and respect. And until the country can say the same, we're going to push it to do that. We have no other choice but to change the systems around us. If we're a conquered victim, then we can't have our own agency. And the truth is we do. So even when I had this extreme fear going into labor and delivery and finding out I was pregnant and all the different kind of attacks that were going to be waged against me and my child, I also was aware that I'm a woman of agency and I'm part of a long legacy of change makers who never accepted these burdens as if they were inevitable, but instead said, okay, well then my choice is to do something about this, to use what I can use to make a difference around these narratives, around changing policy, changing minds so that we are seen in our wholeness, seen in our complexity, because and what I'll say finally is when we focus solely on pain, others see it as if it's the only choice for Black women. And it's almost the expected thing that we think is going to happen. Yeah. And then even, you know, even on our impact on ourselves, like we begin to feel hopeless. It's like, well, I have no choice. I've heard terrible stories of doulas, you know, being asked questions around, should I make sure my will is together? And people mm. are literally giving birth, making sure they're preparing their case I die documents. I'm like, this is terrible. And it makes them feel that 
um, there's nothing they can do. You know, they, they're mm -hmm. going to try their best, but ultimately they're hopeless. And I think that is incredibly dangerous to us to feel that way around something that, you know, should be everybody's opportunity and right to have a good experience, um, you know, in, in giving birth. It's yeah. And even thinking of how that translates into those first moments of life that are so crucial, your mental state as a mother, as you are holding your newborn, you haven't slept since this incredible kind of climactic experience that is just life transforming. Um, but so many people, again, don't spend time even thinking about the mom and that moment and her mindset and how she's feeling. If a black woman is already feeling very afraid and is mainly just grateful that she survived what she thought was going to be this death experience, then how is she now going to suddenly find the love and hope that she needs to think through each day with her child and just enjoying that and not only surviving the experience, but finding her life and her love and her passion. Um, unfortunately, that kind of awful grieving mindset feels like a burden that we're passing on to our kids as well from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, definitely the burden. I was intrigued in your book as well. And, you know, you are the mother of a young black male. I am the mother of a young black male. Mine just turned 17. Oh. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so my fears are, are, are heightening as he's thinking about driving and being out on a different level. And then for your book, you chose to choose three mothers of black males. And I think there is something about being, you know, a mother of a black male in this society. So I want to hear a little bit more about why did you choose the mothers of three black males? And what is it about um, being a mother of a black male that you think is a unique experience? Yeah, with this project, I was really thinking of the many levels of erasure that I could address in one, uh, one writing, uh, one project. And... There were so many different things I thought about. Number one came the civil rights movement and how often we speak about it from this male dominant perspective as if, you know, all of us can name more black leaders than anybody else of the civil rights movement. So I wanted to do something to tackle that in some way. Um, and then I thought about roles in society universally or not universally, I should say more so in like Western communities that are overlooked, underappreciated, unrecognized, not given the credit that they deserve. Um, so motherhood immediately came to mind with that. And those that are doing mother work, as Patricia Hill Collins puts it. Um, and then I also thought about with the mothers of sons, it's not necessarily that they're any more or less a race than the mothers of daughters, because I think there's also a very unique experience there. Um, but or the mothers of non-binary children. But then I thought about how there's something wrong with the gender binary where we assume that young, that young men and boys are only influenced by their fathers. So when we think about Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X and James Baldwin, if you're a fan of these three men, you probably have heard something about their fathers. It's really normal for scholars to go in to men's stories and say, not only are they the heroes of the story, but their fathers are the ones who inspired them <laughs> to become the hero of the story. Whether the father is present or not, whether the father passed away when the child was young or not, whether the father was abusive or not, um, whether they were a good or bad father, we focus on the father. And this actually also happens a lot in my own partner's story. He's a public figure and people often want to ask him about his father. <laughs> when in reality, in the three cases of these three men, as well as in my partner's case, it's the women who formed them and the stories are just being forgotten simply because it doesn't fit a patriarchal society's notion of what influences the sun. And so I was really obsessed with like breaking that apart. Mm -hmm. And before I even gave birth to a son. So it was very coincidental <laughs> that through this experience, I became the mother of a son um, because in Alberta King's case and Louise Little's case and Bertus Baldwin's case, and I show this extensively throughout the book, uh, their passions, their talents, long before they became mothers, are really what translate into what their sons become. Bertus Baldwin was a writer. She helped transform the minds of people around her through her letters. She had a beautiful power over words. And she believed that people needed to kind of push through the darkness to find love and find light and find healing. Her son becomes famous as a writer who calls himself a witness to the power of light. Fascinating. We then think about Malcolm X, whose mother is this radical pan-Africanist 
activist, a Marcus Garvey follower. Some report that she was one of Marcus Garvey's closest confidants. She believes in Black independence, anti-white assimilation. Her son is Malcolm X, who becomes known around the world for Black pride, anti-white assimilation. Fascinating. We think about MLK Jr. His mother was the daughter of Ebenezer Baptist Church. She grows up believing that faith cannot be faith without social justice, that you participate in marches, that you think about boycotts as a, as a means to make a change with you know, companies or papers that are disparaging your community. You use that as a tool to shift something. She doesn't use the word nonviolence, but this is the same exact thing that she herself knows to be true and is one of the first members of the NAACP. Her parents were. So this is his maternal lineage. And she gives birth to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., who makes these tactics famous around the world. Amazing. So this is, these are the stories that completely complicate the narrative that men, boys are only influenced by their fathers. It's not true. It's a part of a strategy to put women in our place, to make us feel like we should see ourselves as weaker, as not having power, as not being influential, but that's just not the truth. Mm. So amazing the way, you know, myths travel and they become real. And then, you know, the patriarchy is a thing. And then, you know, we don't even question it at some point, right? We, we haven't given ourselves the tools or haven't given ourselves the, the space to actually question that, interrogate to say, wait a minute, why are we only talking about the following these situations? And what is that story of the month? That's what I really found so fascinating because you were right. I hadn't thought about it. And I was actually kind of embarrassed <laughs> and a little bit ashamed. Like, wait, why didn't I think about this? And yeah. it's it's critically important. It's such a great book. Thank um, you. And so I know The Three Mothers is for everyone. And I encourage everyone to read it. Just if you're a lover of history, if you're a, a lover of womanhood and 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 storytelling, I mean, Anna, you really did an amazing job. Um, it's just a Thank really you. rich book. But I do want to ask you specifically, what do you want Black mothers to learn from the three mothers? Mm. And like you said, I did write it for so many different people. I think, like you said, everyone has something to gain from it. But for Black mothers very specifically, I want us to feel seen. I want us to feel celebrated. I want us to carry this notion that we know our worth, we know our power, we know our strength, no matter how hard others might try to take that away from us. Um, and also that we walk with that knowledge and that we raise our children with that knowledge. It's crucial for them to see us as people who recognize our own humanity. I think a big reason that MLK Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin had such a deep understanding of the human experience was largely because of their relationships with their mothers. Their mothers were both incredibly strong, of course, because they had to be. Again, they didn't see much other choice in that. But they also shared their vulnerability with their children. They allowed them to see them in moments where they were sad or when they were worried. And their children didn't see them. I mean, Obviously, there is still this kind of strong woman trope that plays out um, and children aren't always going to see their parents as the full human beings that we are. We know that. But that there's a certain extent to which we can kind of defeat the narrative that we can hold it all together on our own, that it's supposed to be that way, that it's okay for me to go unthanked and unrecognized. It's okay for me to not receive credit for what I've done in my child's life. We need to change that. It's important that our children see what we've been through, understand what we've done for them, what we've been willing to do for them. It's a testament to our love for them. Um, and I think that they would better understand us and not only appreciate us better, but have a better understanding of how the world works. There's not magical minions called moms who <laughs> run around and just make things happen and put meals on the table or clean the house or make enough money to support their families on their own. Um, there's effort that goes into that. And a basic recognition of that is really a favor to our children of being aware that this is how the world works. And I have my parents to thank and let me not erase my mom in the process. Yeah. And I think on the other side of that, I mean, one of the greatest lessons I learned, and unfortunately, I learned this on the other side going through divorce was actually I was in this interview um, and I was with, a, you know, on a panel with a young brother and he was talking about how his, he was raised by a single mother. He had, he had a lot of pride about that. And mm. he was saying, oh, you know, my dad left and my mom was fine and she didn't skip a beat and she took care of us. And 
it actually made me sad. And I said to him, well, that's what you saw. You don't really know what happened behind closed doors. And I made a decision that day that, you know, as much as I was trying to be caught up in the strong mother thing that I did not want my son to think that our family broke and I was fine. I was Mm. not fine. Right. And that to allow ourselves to to let our children see the nuances of who we are as not just strong people and workers, but to know that we hurt. And I said to the young brother, I said, you know, you don't know what happened at night when she closed her bedroom door and she probably cried. And Mm. I just really had this moment like, no, I don't want my young black male thinking that he can walk away from his family and everything will be fine and that everybody's going to be fine. No, you know, we we can get there, but there will be consequences. There will be repercussions. And that was on me to be able to show that complexity and that nuance to my children in age appropriate ways so that mm-hmm. they don't also take on this, you know, the world falls apart, but, but my black mom, she's strong and she's fine. Like, no. Um, and so I always lean in on my girlfriends around, well, what's our role in taking down that trope, right? Like yes. we can't carry it ourselves because sometimes we do unknowingly mm-hmm. to our children um, and to think about ways that we can honor our own nuances and our own softness and our strongness and in our interactions with our children because that's yes. really important. And we have to kind of demonstrate that if we want that from others. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's yeah. beautiful, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Anna, I close every podcast interview asking this question and it gets back to why we started around your birth and that is what is our birthright oh our birthright and i would say very specifically for black women because it's been taken from us and people have tried to take it away from us i should say more so um this attempted removal of our basic ability to say i am human i deserve respect I deserve dignity. I deserve to be treated with the same protections and the same supports as other human beings around me. That is our birthright to practice our agency, to bring freedom to ourselves and to allow others to see us in the freedom that we know we have, Um, but also to push systems in our nation to match that view that we have of ourselves. That is a part of our right. Unfortunately, for so long, it's been the case that Black women have had to continue to claim that for ourselves. And I think we're arriving in a moment where hopefully through more attention being paid to Black women's complexities, through more of us speaking about us in our wholeness like we've done today, that can transform from people solely admiring us for our strength and our resilience, and again, only focusing on the grief that we've persisted through, to transforming that into action and saying, let's continue to make this birthright that we should all have available to us a reality to all of us and think very clearly about who that's currently being denied to um, and participate in this as a nation, as a whole. It shouldn't just fall on the individual to say, I'm claiming this for myself. It's also our nation, our world should have that built in so that these birthrights are respected and granted. Yeah, that's a powerful vision. That's a powerful vision. Um, Anna Malika Tubbs, thank you for joining me today. I am so grateful. It's been such an honor to be in your presence. Once again, Anna is the author of The Three Mothers, How the Mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin Shaped the Nation. Please check out this book by Flatiron Books. Go to Anna's website, thethreemothers.com. Um, and please, you know, really dig into this. I think this conversation about motherhood um, in all the ways we talk about erasure, dehumanization, and all these other things is so critical. And it's really important for like the next wave of how we get this this thing right for all of us um, yes. in this space. So thank you for again for joining me. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for all the thoughtful questions and for revolutionizing the way we're talking about Black birth experiences. Thank you.